just wait for all the participants to uh, come back from the breakout rooms and uh, we'll uh, start. Okay. Okay, I think uh, um, everybody's back. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next uh, lecturer, uh, uh, Alvaro Sanchez. Alvaro is a professor at the um, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. And his work focuses on predicting uh, microbial dynamics and uh, microbial um, uh, evolution. And uh, uh, in today's, uh, in actually this uh, cycle of uh, lectures, he will uh, talk about um, the assembly and the evolution of microbial community. And today he's giving the first of three lectures. So thank you very much, Alvaro, for being uh, with us. And please share your screen when you are ready. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you everybody for taking the time to, um, to be here today. So I'm gonna give uh, three lectures um, on the topic of microbial community assembly. And uh, the three are very interconnected. So, and, and I, I'm thinking of them as very, I think relaxed. And, and the idea is that you can get, an, uh, you know, have three hours to explain the, how at least I, I see this problem. And I'm hopeful that, that you know, if, if you have any questions or, or, or anything you, you can interrupt or, or let me know uh, at any point. Um, so as Jacopo said, we, um, we work on this, on this very fascinating problem so of uh, understanding how microbial communities form and how they evolve. And I think this is a very important problem for many reasons, but perhaps the, uh, the main one is because microbes are everywhere. They have colonized all of the, all of the surfaces of the earth. You find them in the bodies of all animals and plants. You find them in the soils and the oceans and absolutely everywhere. And they, in all of these habitats, they carry fundamental and critical functions. They are responsible for the vast majority of nitrogen fixation, for instance, in the atmosphere. They directly impact the health of their hosts, whether animal and plants. And for that reason, understanding the, the composition of these communities is so important. And for those of you who are not necessarily have been paying attention to the entire field of microbial ecology, I'm sure most of you have heard about the human microbiome. Um, this is a a, uh, the realization has been, I mean, perhaps more, more acute in, in the past couple of decades that we share our bodies with, uh, I think, enormous number of microorganisms that have colonized basically all of the surfaces of our bodies that are connected with the outside world. And microbes in our skin, in, in our gut, in our mouth, our stomach, and essentially what, anywhere where they could uh, colonize from the outside world they have. And in all of these areas of our bodies, they form these very um, dense and, and complex ecological communities containing large number of species that interact with each other in really interesting ways. And, um, and a, the outcome of these interactions are the assembly of an ecological community, a microbial community, uh, who, which, as I said before, can have important effects for our health. And um, Given the importance of these communities, a, a critical question is whether we can predict uh, the assembly of these communities uh, in a way that will allow us to manipulate them and uh, to steer these communities towards states that are favorable and away from those that are not. And, um, and this is a, a question that has been is very kind of close to, to the, the heart of my lab. This is the one perhaps the main thing we're interested in. And if we want to develop a predictive theory of microbial community assembly, one that can tell you, okay, if I uh, manipulate my this, uh, if I kind of intervene in a microbiome in this way, I'm going to observe that response. If we if we want to walk towards having such a theory, um, there is an even more fundamental question that we need to understand first, uh, which is how reproducible microbial community assembly is. And the reason for this is that the only way you can predict something. Uh, is if, if it is reproducible, right? Like if, for instance, imagine that you did an experiment 10 times and every time you got a different result, there wouldn't be anything you could predict, right? Um, by the, on the other hand, if you could do the same example, experiment multiple times and every time you get the same result, then there's some signal, there's some phenomenon that you can aspire to predict. 
So, um, so that's a, a very fundamental question, which is uh, how, how predictable is the process itself? And as I will discuss in the next two lectures, um, at this is, the answer is very interesting because it depends at the level of organization at which you're looking at it. And I wanted to start by giving you a specific example and a paper that I, um, that I really liked that came out a few years ago by Stylianos Loka and Michael Dovely. Um, and uh, this is a, a team of researchers that were studying the assembly of uh, the microbial communities that form within the foliage of bromeliad plants. So as you can see here, um, at the base of the, of the, of the foliage, bromeliads have a little, a little um, hole, a little cavity that fills up with water. And you know, this, uh, this water uh, is, is teeming with microorganisms. You have bacteria, archaea, you have protists, you have you know, all kinds of other, uh, other microbes. And it is believed that the composition of those communities can be very important for the plant as it helps them um, fix nitrogen and, and, and some other things. So um, this is also a very interesting model system for understanding this question of how reproducible community assembly is because one could go to the same geographical location. These this plants, I believe this study in particular was in Brazil, Bromeliad, a tropical plant. And you can look at a set of plants that are in close proximity to one another and examine the communities that have assembled in them, right? And these are plants that I said, you know, the, those, the habitats in which those communities form are very similar. The plants are from the same species. They're experiencing very similar temperature, humidity, and potentially also you should be, they should be colonized by very similar bacteria that, that are in their environment. So um, it, it's a very nice natural system to investigate how reproducible microbial community assembly is. And um, just because I wanted to, uh, to walk you through what kind of data they collected and because the data that we collect ourselves look very similar, I wanted to just to take some time to explain to you um, what they, they observed, right? They, they looked at a, um, what, I think it's a few dozen plants uh, that were in close proximity to one another and they measured the, the microbiome on each one of those plants. And the data looks more or less like this. This is the proportion of the microbiome that is made up by different, by different taxa. Um, there's operational taxonomic units, which is, you could think of this as the lowest level of resolution, like a species level, for instance. And, um, and they're looking at the composition of the microbiome of one particular plant. And um, each color here represents a different, uh, a different OTU. And the, the width of this, uh, of its, um, of this color represents the abundance of that OTU of that species in the community, right? So if, if the, uh, for instance, this, this green um, or turqua, whatever color here, um, the width is very small, means that the abundance is small, whereas this brown uh, color here means that it's, uh, the width is larger, it means that that species was more abundant. And uh, when they looked at the composition of plants uh, that uh, the communities uh, associated with the different plants, they found that they were very variable. Um, less than 1% of all the species were found in all of the, all of the plants. And as you can see here, um, each column represents a different plant and, and most of the plants are, um, contain a very different, uh, a very different community. Now, um, intriguingly, what they found, however, is that when, instead of looking at the, um, my, at the taxonomic composition um, of the plants, like they did here, um, they looked at uh, the, um, uh, they look at the metagenome of, of its community. They look at uh, the, 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 um, the abundance or relative abundance of, of genes involved in different uh, metabolic pathways. Uh, they found that if you do that, you know, the result for a given plant looks something like this, right? In, in brown here, they're looking at the abundance of genes involved in fermentation. In blue, genes involved in oxygen respiration, a carbon fixation, and a bunch of other metabolic functions. And when you look at, at that level of resolution, community assembly uh, was much more predictable. And when you look at the metagenome uh, of different plants, you find that they're quite convergent and similar uh, to one another. And this idea, uh, very similar results have been reported in other systems as well. Uh, for instance, in studies of the microbial communities associated to, to microalgae, which I can find that uh, community assembly uh, uh, when you looked at it at the level of, of function and, and, and the metagenome, they found communities that were very similar to one another when they looked at uh, different individuals. Yet when they looked at the taxonomic composition, it was much more variable. Uh, 
And um, the same has been observed, for instance, for various um, body parts in the human microbiome. Again, um, the taxonomic composition, even at, the, even at the phylum level, could be quite variable um, for, uh, for different uh, subjects in the same body part. Yet when you look across uh, different subjects, but look at the level of uh, metabolic pathways that you find and the, and the different fractions of the metagene that are devoted to different metabolic functions, you find that different body parts have distinct microbiomes and, and that they are much more similar from host to host. There's still variation, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's much less. And um, that has been proposed, uh, as led to the proposition that uh, of, of a paradigm for the organization of microbial communities. Uh, and this was again by Estiano Sloka and colleagues, uh, where they, they propose that similar environments should promote similar microbial community function while allowing for taxonomic variation within individual functional groups. Right? So you could have that within a functional group, uh, you could have that different taxa can uh, differ in, in which, uh, and the, the different habitats can differ in which taxa they contain, yet when you look at them at the level of function, they are much more similar to one another. Right, so, so this is pointing to the existence um, of, of, of a generic uh, organization of micro communities. And the, this question that I posed at the beginning of how reproducible micro community is, uh, assembly is, um, then it seems like there are uh, the answer will depend on what level of organization you are um, studying. Um, so, but the, even though there seems to be a, a rule that, that emerges when you look at a large number of different uh, habitats, it's still not very clear where it comes from, right? And, and what is the origin of, of this principle, right? That, that seems to be found so often. Um, so to understand this better, um, it, it's worth thinking a, bit, a little bit about the forces that shape the assembly of microbial com communities, of ecological communities in general, right? So um, ecological communities are the outcome of both deterministic and stochastic processes. So on the, on the deterministic side, you have selection, right? And here the idea is that in a given habitat, you're going to have a, um, some taxa that grow better than others, right? And that are gonna have higher fitness than others taxa. And, and this is gonna to lead to uh, more convergence. If you have two, two different habitats that are very similar to one another, the selective pressures they will experience are going to be also more similar, right? And that can be a force that will help um, to generate convergence in, in community assembly. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a wide range of, of, for, of ecological processes that are stochastic in nature, right? And will lead to more variable community assembly. Uh, you have, for instance, dispersal. It's clear that they, you can only find in one habitat those taxa that were able to colonize the habitat. And um, the process of dispersal, and this is very true in macro communities, is going to be highly stochastic. For instance, think of the bromeliad tanks that I was telling you about before. Um, it is clear that if a specific mosquito uh, arrives and, and you know, lays uh, an egg into one water tank, but not another, then the bacteria that it carries will colonize that habitat, uh, but not the other, right? So, so that is going to be a force that will lead to variability. Uh, of course, microbial populations, even though they're very large, they're still made up by individual cells that have to divide and have to um, and, and, and die, right? So, so you have births and deaths, and all those are stochastic processes too. So uh, finally, you have mutations. Evolution will always be a force, and microbes evolve fast. They have um, relatively large mutation rates and large population sizes, so mutants emerge quite rapidly. And of course, mutations occur randomly in the genome. So that's another force that will generate variation uh, or could generate variation in community assembly. And finally, one um, that is very in interesting is historical continuity, right? We, one of the, the very salient features of microbes is that as they grow, they cause dramatic modifications in their environment. Uh, for instance, I don't know if anyone in here has had experience with growing bacteria in, in the lab, even for, uh, for other reasons than, than doing microbial ecology. Uh, but if you have, even for cloning or whatever, you probably uh, took a colony, say, of E. coli and, uh, and grew it in medium that, for instance, could contain glucose as the main carbon source. You grew it overnight and you harvested the cells the next day. So if you've ever done that exercise, um, you should know that in the process of just going from one uh, small colony to a very large uh, number of cells, the environment that is left out after you harvest your cells is completely different from the one 
at the beginning. In just 24 hours, these bacteria have turned an environment that may have contained glucose as the only carbon source, for instance, into an environment that will contain a large number of other nutrients. And that's not the only way, right, uh, in which microbes uh, can affect the environment. Uh, microbes can engage in microbial warfare with one another. They can release antibiotics and, and, and colicines and other toxins that can kill other bacteria. They release them to their environment as they grow. Um, they also modify the spatial structure of their, of their habitat by forming biofilms. And um, they also secrete enzymes to the outside world that uh, can break down complex, uh, the physical uh, structure of the environment with all kinds of com complex polymers around them. Um, and the collective modification of the environment that microbes uh, cause as they grow uh, leads to uh, another uh, ecological force, if you will, that is a combination of both stochastic and determinism, uh, which is historical contingency. And we can visualize historical contingency quite easily, right? I imagine that you have now uh, two different taxa arriving in an environment, right? And only uh, this one experiences uh, uh, can grow in that environment. So uh, you, you have very strong fitness differences between them. But as this taxon grows in the environment, it'll change it, right? And as it changes that environment, then the other taxon now might be able to grow. Maybe even a, a, a taxon that could not grow in the, in the original environment could, could potentially grow after the first one has been growing in it um, through the, the environmental modifications that it, um, that it applies. And uh, that will mean, of course, that if you have two habitats that are originally very similar from one another and they get colonized by different taxa, because as we said, that first part is quite random, each one of those taxa will modify the environment in a different way. And now those environments won't be similar anymore and they will uh, present different uh, selective pressures that will then uh, impact uh, further colonists that will arrive later, as well as the, just the overall uh, physical and chemical structure of those habitats. So um, what's important here is that some of those forces like selection uh, can lead to reproducibility across habitats that are identical, right? And of course, and not habitats that are not, right? But when at least when habitats are very similar, selection will, uh, or is a force that will let, lead to um, more similar uh, communities uh, under, under certain conditions. Whereas chance and historical contingency can push you away from from similarity and may cause more dissimilar uh, communities. And the complication is, of course, that all of these ecological forces are acting in nature at the same time, and they're very difficult to disentangle mechanistically in, in the wild. So one of the questions we are trying to, well, one of the approaches we're trying to follow in my lab um, is to, to see if it is possible to recreate the process of microbial community assembly under conditions where we can study it um, and we could disentangle uh, and, and control the levels of variation that, uh, in the laboratory. Right? And uh, our idea would be that if, if we want to ask reproducible microbial community assembly is, it would be very helpful to be able to study this in a system where we know, uh, for instance, if our habitats are at least initially all identical from one another or not. It is, this is very difficult to do in the wild, right? Even in the case of the bromeliad plants that I said before, uh, it, you don't really know that all those plants are really identical. You know they're similar, right? But, but you don't really know what the selective pressures are in those habitats, and you don't know how different they are from one another, really. Right? Um, and uh, moreover, we wanted to see if it would be possible to, to have these habitats being as controlled as possible so that we could know what the selective pressures are, or at least have a very good idea of what they might be. For instance, if we can control the number and identity and concentration of all nutrients, if we can control the temperature and the pH and other physical parameters, such as the geometry of, of, the, um, of, the, of the vessel in which the bacteria grow. So if we can control all of those things and make them equal across habitats, then we would be able to ask this question of how reproducible community assembly is in a much more controlled manner. And um, in addition to that, uh, what we seek is a, a system, an experimental system where we can also control uh, a lot of the ecological processes that are very difficult to know even in uh, natural habitats. For instance, in the case of the bromeliads, again, uh, we don't have access to the entire colonization history of those habitats. And we, don't, we do not know if some habitats were colonized by different set of bacteria than others, or this is very difficult to, to really make that inference. But in, under, under laboratory conditions, we can, we can inoculate uh, migrants at known time intervals. And we can also um, 
know how many cells are arriving and with what frequency from which regional pools of species. So all of those things are, um, are things we have under control. We can also control how connected the habitats are, if, if there's migration within them or not. If there are any population bottlenecks, we can impose them. So we wanted to have, a, in other words, an experimental system where we can study this question of how reproducible community assembly is under conditions where we can eliminate a lot of the sources of variation that uh, would occur in nature across habitats so that we can really get to the bottom of uh, what are the intrinsic processes that lead to variation at the community assembly level um, in, in an experimental system. So um, if we had a system like that, the question is if we could predict um, a community assembly. So to address this question and to give you a sense of what is the experimental pipeline in our, uh, in our lab, uh, we start, uh, we use a technique that microbiologists call enrichment cultures and we do it in this high, high throughput. We start from natural samples. For instance, we could take uh, a leaf of, of, uh, of a plant and then we can stick that leaf into a test tube. And at this state, stage, um, we are uh, treating our samples with anti, uh, antifungals and other um, uh, drugs that will eliminate the growth or inhibit the growth of eukaryotes for no other reason that we wanted to, these are the very first experiments we did, so we wanted to uh, make them as simple as possible and, and be left only with the bacteria. And um, with that, uh, we can take all of the bacteria that live here, right, and we can filter all of these um, plant particles, and um, we are left with what's essentially a, uh, only the bacterial component of the community that we had uh, on that leaf. Um, and now what we can do is we could take that, that um, large initial pool of species and sample from it uh, and put it into a bioreactor, which um, is, is a very small, you can think of it as a, being a very small uh, test tube. And we can let, let them, um, we can, we can uh, add some migrants into a bioreactor that contains a synthetic medium, right? This is a, a growth medium that we have created in the lab where we know exactly what all of the nutrients are and we know exactly the amounts that we are, we're providing. And, um, and then this is, for those of you who know more, this is, uh, this, in this experiment I'm gonna tell you about, this is M9 minimal media. Uh, and I'm gonna start by using glucose as the only carbon source, although in, in the future, um, you'll see other, other nutrients as well. But say that, that you, you have a minimal media where this is limited by carbon and it has a single source of carbon here, right? So this is the simplest environment you can think of. This is a liquid environment. There's no spatial structure to begin with. And we are at a single growth limiting factor, um, which is in this case, glucose, imagine. And now once we colonize that habitat from the community, we let the cells grow. We typically let them grow for 48 hours. And, and after 48 hours, we, what we do is we take this, this uh, so some cells will grow, some others will not. But then those that grow, we will we'll take a small sample from here, right? And we'll inoculate another habitat just identical to the one we had on the first day, right? So we, again, we have another little test tube when we put fresh, uh, concentra fresh concentration of all the nutrients, the glucose and all the mineral salts and everything else we're adding. Um, and then we let that grow again. And then after 24 hours, uh, 48 hours, we'll take a small aliquot and put it into a new test tube where we replenish all nutrients and we can keep doing it again and again. This is called serial passaging. Um, and, and, and it's uh, a mechanism you can think of it as a seasonal environment with, uh, with seasonal bottlenecks as well as addition of new nutrients. And then at the end of every 48 hour period, we use 16S community level sequencing to take a census of what cells are present, what species are present, and what their abundance uh, is. So um, again, we do this at the end of every 48 hour period, right, on the, on the grown community before we, we apply the bottleneck. So uh, the, I guess the first question you could ask is if you do this simple experiment, and again, you're looking at the assembly of a community in an environment that contains a single growth limiting resource, right, you, you might not think that more than one species might survive. Right? The, first, the first question is, will you get a community if you do this? Or are you gonna get a single, a single species that will uh, outcompete everybody else? Well, let me give you an example. I mean, the, the answer is no, we, we always get communities, even though we only have a, a single growth limiting resource. Uh, but uh, and, and this is the way that the dynamics look like. Right? On, on day zero, uh, we have a very large community. Uh, and I will show you some examples of what this community look like in a minute. Um, it's, again, each color represents a different genus. And the width of that, of its band, represents the abundance of that genus in the community. Um, all this gray stuff you see over here, these are 
uh, species that are so are at such low abundance that we cannot really show you here all of the bars that you would need to in order to see them. Um, and now what we what we see is that after 48 hours, uh, community uh, has changed as you would expect because some of these taxa could grow but the other ones could not. And, um, and then as a function of time, uh, every single time we do um, one of these 48 hour growth periods, community composition starts uh, um, changing. And after about eight to 12 transfers, you see that community composition has reached the state where um, every day after every 48 hour period, the communities look very much like, like they did the day before. So they reach a state of, uh, we call this an, a state of equilibrium, understanding that of course, there might be even slower um, time scales here that we're not capturing. Um, but I, we have actually done experiments now where we have propagated communities for longer time. But for, for, for the rest of this talk and, 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 and the next two, let's just assume that after, once the community is stabilized here, that this will be a state of equilibrium. And as I will show you, we have probably the last lecture, we have solid evidence to believe that this is actually very close to an actual dynamical equilibrium. Um, all right, so, um, so this is the system we have. And let's go back to the question we're asking. Like how reproducible is my community assembly in these habitats that are so well controlled? And uh, I think here the idea is, okay, so a system will go, is gonna be reproducible if every time we do an experiment, we're gonna get the same result, right? If every time we did the, exp an ex the, same, the same experiment, we got different results, then we would not be able to predict community assembly, right? So this is what we did, right? We take um, from the same species pool, we inoculate um, eight uh, replicate uh, populations, uh, eight rec replicate habitats that are identical to one another. And, um, and we are going to propagate them in the exact same manner as I showed you before. And I'm gonna show you the, the, the community assembly we observe after about 80 generations uh, or 12 of these transfers. Again, so this is the outcome, right? So if you look at community composition at the species level, you find that even though these eight habitats are identical to one another, as identical as you can make them, right? even though they're all colonized from the same regional pool at the same time, right? So even though we're eliminated all sorts of variation to the, to the maximum extent we could, right? I mean, of course, you, know, you still have to factor in human error and, and these are experiments, like nothing is perfect, but you know, this is this gotta be much more reproducible. For instance, the bromelia tanks I showed you before, right? This is well-controlled laboratory study. And as you can see uh, here, uh, the, each of these times you did the experiment, you basically got a different outcome. Right? Um, here we're showing uh, species or in fact, uh, genus level, it doesn't matter. And again, different colors represent different, um, different, uh, different uh, ESVs. Um, and you could see, here, I don't know if you can resolve this here, but these are two different shades of red, right? Um, or three different shades of red. So anyway, you, you can see that communities are not the same, right? even though you do this experiment multiple times. However, we also noticed that if instead of um, grouping all of the uh, all of the, the, the the reads that we were sequencing by species, we grouped them by the taxonomic family that these belong to. Um, what we find is that when we do that, then community assembly becomes much more reproducible, and uh, and that all of these eight replicates uh, contain uh, ratios of the same two dominant families. In blue, this is Enterobacteriaceae. This is the family to which the famous bacterium E. coli belongs to. And in red here, this is Pseudomonadaceae, which is another uh, very common, in this case, a very common environmental bacteria. You find them in the soils and plants and, and also in the human body. It could be, some members of the family could be also a human pathogen. All right, so, so you see that when you do the experiment uh, eight times, the results that you observe are very reproducible at the family level, but not reproducible at all at the species level. Great, so, so this is if you use um, the same uh, inoculum, right? But what if you use uh, different uh, species pools inoculating its habitats, right? How reproducible would things be then? I mean, I think there's all kinds of reasons why you would imagine that this should, this should lead to less reproducibility, right? Because its habitat now is being colonized by a different um, group of bacteria. So if anything, you would expect things to be less reproducible than they were before, where all these habitats were colonized by the same bacteria, the same, by the same inoculum. So uh, we went and collected samples, environmental samples from uh, soil, plants, aquatic communities, like soccer field, and various other soil, plant, and aquatic uh, environments uh, around uh, you know, a 20, mi 20 miles radius um, of our lab. And um, if you look at, this is at the, um, 
I don't know if you can see this here, um, the different communities um, were quite different from each other, right? They're, I'm talking about the soil inocula. Even when you look at this at the order level, you, you find that they are, um, you know, they contain very different uh, species and, and abundances and, uh, and taxonomic groups. Okay, hold on. All right, so now when we repeat the experiment uh, that we did before, but now uh, using this, uh, these 12 regional species pools that again uh, are very different from one another, and we process them through the same uh, pipeline, we, we inoculate um, them in, in, into a different, uh, a different test tube, and all of them contain glucose as a carbon source that they grow on, and you incubate them for 80 generations, just as we did before. Um, what you find is that you have um, that each of these inocula uh, lead to a different community, right? And, and at the species level, which is you know, not surprising because we, we are using different pools of species, right? Uh, yet when you do the same thing we did again and look at uh, assembly at the family level, now you find that community assembly are still very reproducible, even though the inocula what we used in each one of these uh, wells is different from each other. So this is painting a, a, this picture that community assembly is actually very reproducible, right, at the, at the family level, if conditions among wells are, are, are the same, right? Um, even when you're, you're putting different sets of taxa on each one of those wells. And this is another way to visualize this data, right? Uh, at the start, each of these communities have very different fractions of these two dominant families, Interactivisia, Sudmonadesia, as well as other families. Uh, but at the end, they have converged to uh, a very similar location on this on the simplex, um, highlighting uh, the, the, the degree of reproducibility that one sees in our experiments. All right, so um, all of this that told you about um, prompts three questions, which are going to be the subject of the three lectures I'm giving. Uh, the first, yeah, which is going to be, I mean, the rest of this talk, I'm going to be talking about um, this first point of why do so many species coexist on a single limiting resource. Uh, tomorrow, I will tell it, be talking about. Um, why community assembly is so convergent at the family level? What does that mean? That at higher levels of taxonomy, community assembly is more reproducible. And finally, the last day, I will be telling you more about uh, why is community assembly so variable at the species and genus level. Right? Uh, and, and, and this is um, going to try to give you explanations for these three um, kind of interesting results we've, we've, uh, we've revealed. Right? The first, that many taxa can actually coexist uh, when used to play a single limiting resource. And second, that the, the, those, the composition of those communities that will form are gonna be very similar at the family level and very variable at the species level. All right, so today I just wanted to devote the rest of this, um, of this, of this lecture to this first question, uh, which is why do so many species coexist uh, on a single uh, growth limiting resource? Um, so the, the kind of the reason why these might be so much surprising is that is the competitive exclusion principle, right? Um, we are providing a single uh, limiting resource in, in the case that that occupies in, in the data I showed you before, it's glucose. And, and this is a, a carbon limited environment, right? And glucose is a source of carbon. So, so you might imagine that, or at least in fact, that's what I did when I first did these experiments back in the day, that I was gonna see just a single taxon that would outcompete everyone else. And uh, if, you know, very si simple, but yet profound ecological theory tells you that that's more or less what you should expect, at least that coexistence should be difficult under conditions where you have uh, a single supply nutrient. There, there are, uh, of course, uh, ways around it, but uh, at least kind of your, your first null expectation would be that coexistence is gonna be hard. Um, and in particular, that, that, that you really shouldn't have, be expecting to have more species than there are limiting resources, right? So, and here we're having one. So um, the solution uh, really, or the idea that, that, that we had was that this may be uh, caused by um, a phenomenon that is very widespread in microbial communities, which is metabolic cross feeding. And I gave you some examples before about how when microorganisms grow in an environment, they can fundamentally alter that environment. Right? And, um, Perhaps the, the, the best way to illustrate how powerful this can be is uh, to tell you a little bit about this one experiment that is one of my favorite uh, experiments of all time. It's, it's a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, result. So um, this is a, uh, an analysis of a previous experiment that was done in the lab of Julian Adams, where 
um, they had evolved a single uh, clonal population of the bacterium E. coli in a chemostat. So a, for those of you who are not familiar with what a chemostat is, so you, you think it's, it's basically a continuous um, culture device. Uh, you have a vessel where uh, it's, a, it's a growth chamber where you would have, for instance, a population of E. coli growing. And then you are constantly feeding nutrients uh, from a medium reservoir. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, you, you are, um, what's wrong with my mouse? I don't know why. And okay. And here um, you are also taking out um, media, right? As well as cells. So you are keeping, for instance, the volume constant, right? Of, the, of, the, of, your, of your vessel. So now um, the faster you flow, the faster you, you take out matter too, right? So you are in a chemostat, you can, you can control the, the feeding rate, which is the same as the flow rate through, the, through this, uh, through this uh, system. And you can also control the, the content of the medium that you're supplying and so on and so forth. So in this case, there was a chemostat uh, that contained a single clonal population, originally clonal population of E. coli. Um, and it was adapting, uh, it was uh, grown in this environment for um, over 700 generations. And um, as E. coli grew in this environment, uh, again, this is, this is an isogenic population. Um, what, what, what it does is that as it uptakes glucose, um, it will metabolize the glucose and E. coli has a form of glucose metabolism that um, is uh, respirofermented, right? So to grow fast on E. coli, it, needs to, to, to grow fast on, on glucose, E. coli needs to, um, to partially ferment it. Right? And what it will do is that it will metabolize the glucose and, um, and produce, um, uh, part of that goes through the entire TCA cycle, but some part is um, just drive into, into overflow metabolism. And what that results is, is into the um, production of large, relatively large quantities of um, fermentation by products like acetate, glycerol, um, succinate, pyruvate, and other organic acids that are produced as E. coli uh, grows on glucose. So um, while it grows on glucose, it um, releases other nutrients into the environment. And, um, and as it does that, it changes the biochemical and nutritional composition of that environment. So um, as E. coli grows in, in this glucose in the chemostat, it's transforming an environment that where it has a single growth limiting resource into an environment that contains other, uh, other niches as well. So, um, so that leads to, um, in, in their study, to in, in, a, in a relatively short time, about 750 generations, the originally isogenic population of E. coli had diversified into an ecosystem. And right? so uh, one, uh, on the one hand, they observed that E. coli had, um, that there was a, a strain of E. coli that had uh, evolved a, a stronger growth rate in glucose and uh, a larger uptake rate of, of glucose. But, uh, an, an avoidable consequence of growing faster in glucose is that you're going to have to be more wasteful, right? And, and that you're going to have to uh, create more acetate and more glycerol and release it to the environment. And that enhanced concentration of acetate and glycerol um, that is where the cells are basically stewing on led to the creation of niches that were occupied by other derived strains that had adapted to uh, consuming acetate and glycerol. So in other words, in, in less than a thousand generations, E. coli had diversified from a single clonal population into a, a small ecosystem uh, consisting of um, three uh, cross-feeding strains that coexisted with each other. Right? And again, this is the power of, of cross-feeding, right? Um, you can give them bacteria single growth limiting resource, but they're going to change the environment and create other growth limit, other resources that um, provide the substrate for for other, uh, other cells to grow, potentially leading to a, a more diversity than you would expect naively. So um, to get a sense of whether cross-feeding could be a ecological force um, uh, of importance in our, in our habitats, uh, we did experiments where we took, um, in this case, one of our communities and we isolated some of the dominant members. And um, what you see here, each of these, um, uh, the circles here are, are a colony of a different species. And you can see that here that you have different morphologies of these colonies and, and that is um, indicative of different uh, species present in the community. Each, each species contains its own, uh, when it uh, 
forms a colony, the colony has a different shape, right? So we're able to, to separate and to isolate the members of, for instance, this community here, uh, which contained uh, three coexisting taxon of, of the family Enterobacteriaceae, Enterobacter, Raultella, and Citrobacter, as well as one taxon of the genus um, Pseudomonas. And one, which is the Stenotrophomonas, which we were not able to isolate because it doesn't grow on its own. It requires the presence of its ecological uh, partners in order, to, in order to grow in this habitat. Um, Okay, so first of all, we find that all of these species can grow. Uh, uh, there's four that, that we were able to isolate, are able to grow on glucose as the only carbon source. Now, the question we ask then is, can they also grow on the uh, metabolic secretions um, of the metabolites released by the other, by, by other species? So we did a very simple experiment. We took each of the isolates and grew them on glucose uh, for 48 hours. And, uh, and after those 48 hours, we, we took the, the medium uh, that was left over and uh, used it as the substrate on which the other taxa were, were put. Right? So you would take another species and see if it could grow on an environment that contained no glucose no more. There was no glucose left. It was completely consumed, but contained all of the metabolic secretions by the former, right? And we grew uh, all the taxa and metabolic secretions of each other. And the result was quite what's striking, right? Uh, here I'm showing one example. This is uh, Citrobacter, one of the four members of this, this, this community, growing in the secretions of Enterobacter, which is another of the members. And on, on gray, here I show you the growth of Citrobacter in glucose. You see that it has this very sudden uh, uh, rapid growth, uh, which is caused by the overflow metabolism. When, when Citrobacter grows, uses this fermentative pathway. And during that time, it grows really, really fast. And then it reaches uh, this first plateau, which it reaches when glucose runs out. And then it starts, uh, I'm talking now about the gray curve here, um, Citrobacter would start growing on its own secretions. But if you grow it entirely on the secretions of Enterobacter, you will see that um, the growth rate will never be as, uh, as large. I mean, the, the slope of this growth curve, uh, which is here in black, will never be as large as the one in glucose. But uh, it can still grow, grow quite robustly and it can reach high yields, right? What this shows is that there's uh, still, even after glucose is consumed, a very large growth potential in, in these bacteria on the byproducts, right? Uh, that that cross-feeding can be quite substantial in our communities. And we repeated this experiment for every possible pair in, in these four. And we noticed that all four of these taxa could grow on, all of them could grow on glucose, but they could all grow on each other's metabolic secretions. And uh, I'm going to tell you more about this uh, in, in, in the next uh, lecture tomorrow. Uh, but before I, I move on to the next, I just wanted to highlight how important uh, cross-feeding can be even at the, at the level of the whole community. Here we are, we are plotting the biomass of the community as a function of time. And I am plotting it um, as well as uh, the amount of glucose in the environment. So we measure the amounts of glucose present at time zero, which is there was a 0.2% glucose in the environment. And then after 24 hours, when we took the next measurement, we quantified uh, the growth, the total amount of growth of 95 different communities that had spontaneously assembled in glucose environments. Whereas the, those are the um, 95 independent experiments from different inocula. And we noticed that, of course, as you would expect, there's a lot of cells, right? Cells had grown on glucose. Um, but after 24 hours, glucose was completely gone. It has been exhausted. Yet growth continued strong for another uh, 24 hours. And in fact, uh, now we know that uh, growth had, um, that glucose had, has been exhausted even before those 24 hours. Uh, depending on the community, it typically takes between 12 and 18 hours for glucose to be exhausted. So the, the total amount of growth on the byproducts, um, uh, now we're quantifying this to be um, about the same as the total amount of growth that, um, that occurs in glucose, right? The total amount of biomass. Um, and um, what we can do then is um, when, when we did this in collaboration with uh, my colleague Pankaj Mehta, and what we were trying to do is see if we could incorporate uh, this um, cross-feeding into the MacArthur consumer resource models. And um, the ones where, that will tell you that you should only expect to see a single species in a single growth limiting uh, um, resource. Um, and indeed the, the simulations uh, recapitulate our, our findings. So the, the, the only difference really that we're adding is, is this term here, which uh, incorporates uh, the, the metabolite production uh, through, uh, through cross-feeding. 
and the rest is exactly the same as the MacArthur model. And you know, again, we, we observe that when, when we set the cross feeding to zero in, in an environment where we supply a single growth limiting uh, resource, there's a single species that can survive, the other ones uh, are competitively excluded. But when we assume that the, 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 the cross just by using random matrices uh, that capture the amount of cross feeding, uh, we find that there's generically multiple species coexisting. And the number of taxa you see is about half, typically on average, uh, the, the total number of resources that can be supplied through cross feeding. All right, so uh, I've given you some, some evidence um, that cross feeding is very important, that, it, it, uh, that the environment is no longer a one resource community after even a few hours of growth, and that that is very likely um, giving us uh, the, the multiple species uh, being able to coexist. But there are other potential factors, right, that could lead to coexistence even without cross feeding. And one of them is spatial structure, right? Uh, you, you might find that different taxa are occupying different, uh, different niches within, uh, spatial niches within our habitats. So all the experiments that I've told you about were done in stable um, liquid environments, right? So it's, it's, it's liquid environments that are, are still, we're not shaking them or anything like that. And when that is the case, then you, you may imagine that different bacteria might be able to be occupying different strata uh, on, the, on, the, on the, either some, some, tax, some taxa could be, for instance, living in the air water interface, Others could be living uh, in, the, in the solid liquid interface at the bottom and so on. So we wanted to, to get a sense of to what degree this would be important. So what we did is that we repeated the experiment uh, by shaking our, our vessels, our growth vessels vigorously, therefore removing as much of, um, of spatial structure as we could. Um, and I just have to say also, we had no evidence of biofilm formation, um, at least suggesting that, um, that that also was not uh, an issue. And every single time we've done it, we've observed coexistence of multiple taxa, right? So even when you remove spatial structure to the best of your ability, um, then multiple taxa can still coexist together on a single supplied resource. Uh, another potential possibility is temporal niches, right? and um, that, that could also lead to coexistence. And to understand why, uh, let's go back to this community that we have been um, talking about. Uh, that we have kind of uh, dissected before that contains these four taxon, Citrobacter, Enterobacter, Pseudomonas, and Rabutella. You know, one possibility could be that, that even if cross-feeding was not playing an important role, um, as taxa grow on glucose, it might be that uh, different taxa have an, a growth advantage over others at um, different uh, concentrations of glucose. For instance, it could be that Citrobacter had an advantage at very high glucose concentration, but then as the, as the, as the media, as the, as the community starts depleting the amount of glucose, uh, it will drop below the level where it has an advantage. And it might be that later on, uh, Enterobacter in, in this period here, uh, at this level of glucose concentration, Enterobacter has an edge over the others, a competitive advantage, uh, or it could be that then later Pseudomonas and later Rautella, right? So simply by depleting the amount of glucose as the cells grow, that's another way in which bacteria are modifying the environment. And that could potentially lead to uh, coexistence. In fact, uh, in some cases in, in yeasts, it has been observed that that is a mechanism that is important. Uh, there's some, some yeasts that are better at growing at high glucose concentrations, others are better at growing at lower glucose concentrations, right? So, so that could lead potential to, potentially to a, stabilization, a stabilization mechanism. So um, we, we wanted to, to test this, this idea. So what we did is that we took those four taxa and then we grew them at different glucose concentrations and measure the growth rates at those concentrations. And what we did then is we uh, parameterized the growth rate as a function of glucose for each one of these four taxa and um, using a, a, a monot model. And then we just um, created a, a very basic consumer resource model that contains this uh, parameterization and simulated uh, the, the, the growth um, of our um, communities again, assuming this periodic um, supply of glucose every 48 hours, followed by a, a dilution. So, so we uh, parameterized this and asked whether um, in, under the conditions of our experiments, you would expect these four taxa to, to coexist. And the answer is no, right? Um, the, you can even hint, just qualitatively looking at the data, that there really isn't a very serious crossover, right? Uh, Citrobacter tends to grow on glucose better 
than, than the other system, the only one that crosses over, but Enterobacter, Pseudomonas, and Rautella, their growth curves are very parallel to one another, right? So there, it's not like they're occupying different um, concentration niches that with the depletion of glucose over time might lead to coexistence. Another possibility is um, acidification. Again, it's, it's, it's another way in which bacteria can change the environment without necessarily invoking any cross-feeding. So um, as I was telling you before, the production of acetate and, and other organic acids uh, and lactic acid in particular will bring the pH down, right? And if you look at the, the various members of this community, Enterobacter, Rolotella, and Citrobacter, these are Enterobacteriaceae, which are fermentative, um, and they all produce um, different organic acids. And when they do, the pH of the environment comes down, right? So one possibility was that um, as these cells are growing, the pH is dropping, right? And if the pH is dropping, it might be that some types are better than others at different pHs, right? So this is another mechanism of niche construction in this case that is not mediated by cross-feeding, simply is lowering the, uh, increasing the acidity of the environment slowly. And it could be the different taxa have a, a growth advantage at different pH values. However, what, what we find is that even though each one of these taxa in isolation um, will lower the pH of the community, uh, of, the, of the habitat, the community itself does not, right? So that when you look at the, the pH over time for a community, and, and here are some examples, uh, the pH rarely drops below six, and in most cases even, um, even remains very, very similar uh, over time to what it was at the beginning. Again, the, the individual species themselves do acidify the environment, but the community itself um, does not, at least to any appreciable degree. Uh, and at any rate, we also measure the growth rates of these taxa at pH ranging from six to seven, which is where the pH uh, lies in over the 12, 48 hour incubation time. And the, there's really no crossover point either um, for that. And finally, what we've been also looking into is cell death, right? So one possible mechanism that is not cross-feeding but could also lead to coexistence is, is cell death. Uh, and there's two different ways in which you could see this. Um, for instance, you could think of, um, well, we're growing these communities under uh, serial growth conditions. So we are growing them for 48 hours. And in that time, cells have time to grow, but also they will have time to die, right? So if cells are coexisting with each other, it's gotta be true that they have the same fitness, right? So basically every, every species that is coexisting in stably in these environments uh, will have to double um, exactly 6.7 times every 48 hours uh, if they want to coexist with each other. And it is possible that that is, rich, that is done because some cells actually grow better in glucose than others, but then they die, right? And, and then the two cut, cuts up at the end, right? So that's one possibility. Uh, but another possibility also has to do with environmental modifications. As cells die, they will also spew out their contents um, out into the environment, right? So that can also create niches um, but that, I wouldn't call that cross-feeding, right? It's not really cross-feeding when you're dying. Um, so at any rate, we, we wanted to explore right, this question and, and we asked how much death we observed in our, in our habitats as a function of time. And um, there are various experimental techniques you could use to monitor cell death in culture. And uh, there are both um, dyes that will stain to depolarized membranes that and when a membrane depolarizes, you, you see a non-viable cell. Um, but also when cells lies, they, they leave these this kind of corpses behind that you can also detect by phase contrast microscopy. So we looked at micrograph after micrograph of these communities to try to quantify the, the number of cells that were um, either depolarized or dead uh, or lies uh, after at different time points. And what we observed, and this is for two different communities, that the fraction of dead cells is, uh, is relatively small and we don't really see, um, in one case we saw a, a little bit of a, a change over time, but in the other we really didn't. So um, it doesn't seem like cell death is gonna be a major contributor to, uh, to coexistence in our communities. We're not seeing anything massive um, at least. All right, so um, in this first lecture, I introduce you to the problem that we're gonna be talking about for the next two. And I've been also focusing on, I'll tell you about these three questions that we wanted to, to address. Um, and I've been focusing on this one, right? And why so many species coexist on a single limiting resource. The, the answer that we are finding is that the, by and large, the main reason is metabolic cross-feeding. Um, there's many other contributors and I'm, I'm not claiming that uh, 
acidification or, or that other uh, factors could not contribute as well. In fact, the, the, the very chance, I mean, if cells die, they will release the content, even though there, there are not many cells. And that is part of the environment, right? So basically everything these cells are doing affecting the environment will affect the coexistence. But cross-feeding is a very, very large factor, right? Like uh, about half of the total biomass that we observe in our communities is, is originates from molecules that uh, have been released to the environment for nutrients that have been released to the environment by the bacteria that, that grew on the supplied resource, right? So it's, it's, it's a, from what we have been able to tell the dominant factor uh, in our communities. So um, the summary of this first lecture um, is, is simple, right? First, uh, we, we have observed that a fairly large number of taxa can coexist in CLD passive environments with a single, single supplied limiting resource. Um, we find metabolic cross-feeding being a primary uh, responsible for that coexistence. And um, we also find that communities that are assembled in simple habitats uh, can exhibit reproducible assembly at higher levels of taxonomic organization, a family or higher, but they're very variable at lower levels of taxonomy. And uh, this behavior is, is reminiscent of this metabolic uh, versus convergence versus um, or functional, functional convergence despite taxonomic divergence that people have reported in nature. But we have a better chance of understanding this mechanistically uh, because these communities have been assembled in habitats that we understand. And uh, this is something that I will explain uh, uh, tomorrow and on Wednesday, and we'll get uh, to it in more depth. Um, so um, I just wanted to close by thanking everybody in my lab um, and who are the people who have been doing this work. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have to say. If you have any, any questions, I'm happy to take them. Great, thanks a lot, Alvaro, for the fantastic lecture. So there are a few questions from the chat that I can start uh, reading from you. And in the meanwhile, if uh, anyone wants to ask a question, please use the raise and tool of um, Zoom. So there is uh, Liao who is asking about the uh, cross feeding, whether you have measured uh, metabolomics in the spent medium to uh, determine which metabolites are key mediators. And, uh, that it might, and he comments that it might be interesting to compare the number of species in the community and the number of such key cross feeding mediators. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. We have done metabolomics for some of these communities. And so the, the dominant byproducts that we observe are, are acetate, uh, succinate, uh, pyruvate, and lactate. And then we see a large number of other, um, by, other byproducts at, at relatively low abundances. And this is doing uh, LCMS, uh, mass spectrometry. And, um, there are, of course, a large number of resources, right, in the in, in the mass that are you know detected uh, through mass spec. But as I said, the 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 the, he, the key here is not just the number of resources you have, but also their abundance, right? Because many are very uh, are relatively rare. Now, in simulations we've done, um, it is true that even just that, even resources that are relatively uh, rare can be critical to stabilize communities, right? So, in principle, you could have uh, uh, more. So you could have just a few, a handful of resources at high abundance and a large number of resources at low abundance. And those low abundance resources, even though they may, may, might seem unimportant, can actually be quite critical, at least in simulations, for coexistence of, uh, of fairly uh, decent number of species in, in our habitats. So um, I, I completely, I think I, I, this is a very interesting question, is, is how many resources do you need uh, in order to have coexistence? Um, and, uh, but we, we've done also experiments in our lab where we went from just having one resource to two or three. And what we find is that, that the richness of our communities doesn't grow, it barely does, right? So even though you're doubling or tripling the number of resources, the, the number of taxa you see uh, barely grows at all. It does a little bit, but only in a statistical sense. And, and it's uh, in most cases, uh, there's no increase in richness, right? Um, so th there's, uh, I suspect that there's other factors that limit diversity um, in, our, in, in our communities. And we're still trying to, under we have some ideas of why this is, but we don't have any, any actual evidence at the moment. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That, that's fantastic answer, yeah. Okay, uh, great. So there is uh, uh, one question uh, from Lorenzo. Uh, hi, 
uh, I wanted to ask you a bit more about um, the eight communities uh, developed from the same sample on the same resources. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask about uh, if you have any data on uh, temporal stability, so the stability of the composition in time instead of on different samples. Right. So um, yeah, we, we do. Um, I here I'm showing one. I mean, we have I have other plots I could show you, uh, but this is quite um, this is quite general, right? So um, this is I have, and I can and maybe uh, I, maybe I can bring a slide for next next time and show it at the beginning. Uh, but yeah, I know we, we've done it. And in fact, in fact, it's in the paper. If you if you if you go to the supplementary material where we show data like this for twelve other inocula, that we find is that there's this initial. Actually, it's quite remarkable. We tend to see an, an initial um, increase in the abundance of enteroecthesia, but then as a function of time, it stabilizes, and after about twelve transfers, remains constant. And we have another paper where we've uh, done this for eighteen transfers instead of twelve. And, and yes, once you, once they reach uh, about, it depends on the composition, but it, between seven and 12 transfers, the community will stabilize and remain constant for the remaining of the experiment. Um, and we finally have an experiment that we just did it, that we propagate uh, 12 communities for a year, um, and, but we're still processing the data. So, um, so yes, we, we have data uh, on it and, and it's in the supplement of, the, of, of this paper, which I don't know why, sorry, this is from an old slide. It's um, 2018 in science, and, and you can see the in the supplement you can see the, the results that look exactly like this, but for other communities and they look uh, very similar. Thank you very much. Great. There is um, a question from Martina. Hi, um, I have a question regarding the spatial structure, and I agree that you can have coexistence without spatial structure, but since you have different results when you shake or you don't shake, do you think that uh, stratification might be important, especially because you have some, I don't know, uh, byproducts of species that uh, maybe are doing uh, uh, an aerobic metabolism that maybe are at the bottom? And right. Um, so we th that's a good, a good question. And it, it, here, um, this is uh, they're colored differently, but but th this is so I'm sorry for for that. But this is uh, this is enterobacteria. And, and this is pseudomonads. So the, at the family level, uh, the, the results are not that different, right? They're very similar whether you shake or not. That's just the coloring is different, but uh, sorry, sorry about that. But, but we, we find that um, actually they're flipped. Here, blue is red, red should be blue. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, we see the same. It's just enterobacteria, pseudomonadisia. But we have now done experiments in, in deeper wells where um, with a different geometry. And when you do it then, then you do find that the respirers um, have a hard time. And I think it's because of oxygen depletion that cannot be um, supplied fast enough, right? So, I mean, clearly if oxygen cannot get through, then the respirer is gonna have a hard time because they don't have electron acceptors and um, fermentative metabolism is going to be favored. Um, but at least in this experiment that I'm showing here, uh, we, like for instance, when, when you do this in 24 well plates or in, in, on in, in not very deep 96 well plates, then uh, the results are very consistent and it doesn't matter whether you shake or not. Uh, the, the, the outcome is very similar, but your point is well taken. And I think if you, if, if you have a, a deeper well where there can be a, a, an oxygen gradient, then by all means, I think that spatial structure can be quite important. Okay. Uh, thank you. Maybe can I ask you just a quick question? The metabolomics were targeted or untargeted? Um, so we've done uh, targeted, um, and we've also done more recently untargeted too. Okay. Thank you. Great. The, the next question is from uh, Kiseok. Oh, uh, hello. Hi. Uh, I, I just uh, put the questions in the chat, but um, do you like? Do you have the comparison between the effect of serial passaging? Because if you do a lot of serial passaging, then it is putting a selection pressure on on the microbes that prefer the carbon, the single carbon source. Sorry, I, I, I don't think I could understand the question. Can you repeat, please? Okay. Because um, in, in your experiments, you do like a lot of serial passaging, huh? uh, more than 80 generations. Mm -hmm. So 
what what would the effect of those serial passages be on the final uh, final constitution of these uh, microbial communities? Because I think those it, those pr procedures would have would impose selection on the microbes. And right, I right. Was, yeah, I was curious if if you didn't do the serial passaging, would the what the Even if you if we had done a single batch, right, and, and never, right? No, that's a very that, that's a really interesting question, right? Because one one alternative, and with something we're exploring now, would be to have just done a single batch, right, uh, and then uh, let cells basically stew in there, right, and and, and die and whatever, right? Um, th there's that could that is something we're exploring now because I I, I think by, in fact, we've now done experiments where we do serial passaging every, so you could think of that experiment as a, as a limit, right? When, when T tends to infinity, right? Of uh, a serial passaging, right? Of an incubation time T, right? Uh, and now I can tell you that if you do the, 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 we've done experiments where we incubated only for 24 hours instead of 48, and the pseudomonas are gone, right? We only see enterobacteriaceae and diversity plummets, right? Um, if you go from 24 to 48, then you see pseudomonas appearing, right? Um, because the pseudomonas are, are, are the primary consumers. This is kind of spoiling tomorrow's lecture, but it's okay. Uh, pseudomonas are the primary consumers of the byproducts in, in these communities, and they grow primarily in the, on the second half of the, of the 48 hour, right? Uh, so I suspect that if you leave it longer and longer, right, then you're gonna start catching up other, other, other species that may grow more slowly, right? But that um, that may be maybe they won't die, right? And, and they will they will. Uh, I would expect to start seeing cell death if you let the cells there for a very long periods of time, and they will have a succession of, of, of bacteria. Now the complication though is that uh, bacteria can start uh, mutating very fast. Uh, they can enter this gasp state and start mutating really fast when they start, right? Uh, and there's other other issues that could occur when cells are starving, from prophase induction to I mean, evolution will uh, become a more important role, uh, play a more important role, I think, in, in our communities. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question, one that we want to explore in the future. Um, and we've started by looking at just going in the other direction first, looking at what happens if we cut short incubation time. Um, but I, my expectation is that as you increase the, the incubation time, diversity is going to go up. Right? And uh, you're gonna have, uh, more attacks together, but it's a, just a hypothesis. We haven't done the experiment yet. Uh, I have another question. So if like um, w when you are doing 16S RNA sequencing, uh, is there a way to rule out the dead cells in the tube from being detected as live cells? I'm having some trouble with my mouse. So I don't know what's going on. Okay. Oh, so can, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah, when you are doing the amplicon sequencing, would there yeah. be some methods to rule out the dead cells as dead being common live cells? Right. Um, that would be difficult just with 16S. Um, we, for the experiments that I've shown you today, we did we did do this, right? We uh, we measure um, we did microscopy to get an uh, an estimate of how much cell death there was and how much that was contributing to our um, community assembly, and we found that. Um, it should have a very small contribution, right? There's, there's very few cells that are in a either dead, dead, or in a metabolically arrested state that likely would be dead, like you know, using live dead staining. Um, so, so yes, but I, I agree that if you did this, I think the only the only thing I could think of is this: is would be just a microscopy in conjunction with 16S um, to get a sense of how important cell death is. Um, I mean, at least by cell viability, maybe more than death. That is always difficult to, to it's harder than it seems, but at least viability or using CFUs might also be another way to, um, to do it. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Great, there are actually more questions, but uh, in, uh, we are sort of out of time, but I think that there will be uh, time for them uh, in uh, either tomorrow or on Wednesday or on the next uh, lectures. So um, I ask everybody who has questions to keep them and ensure that uh, uh, since the, the, the lectures are on very similar topics, they could be asked in the next uh, lecture. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Alvaro, for this uh, very nice overview.
and uh, um, we'll uh, uh, take a break of uh, 